Good evening. I'm Jim Zirin, and this is The Digital Age. Once again, we are broadcasting from the TV studios of the Columbia School of Journalism. Our question tonight is about terrorism, technology, and the law. And with us to discuss it is an expert in the field. He is Matt Waxman. Matt Waxman is a professor of law at Columbia Law School. He enjoys the dual distinction of being a senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, he is an expert in the legal aspects of the use of force against terrorism. And uh, he is a member, of course, of the Council on Foreign Relations. And we're delighted to have you with us, Matt. Thanks for having me. Now, uh, in dealing with terrorism, uh, what are the most effective weapons that we have? Well, I, I mean, I think it's important to understand that in dealing with a, a problem, a threat like terrorism, uh, uh, there's no one tool that's going to solve the problem. I think for the United States, uh, 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 the position has been that military options are among the tools that we've used. But ultimately, dealing with any terrorism threat uh, uh, requires, uh, I, I think, developing a, a, a network of relationships, military to military relationships, intelligence sharing, law enforcement cooperation, uh, in order to, to neutralize uh, uh, those threats, but also to try to deal with some of the underlying causes. Now, uh, of course, the obvious uh, first way using military force is to kill them. And uh, one of the ways we kill them, and in fact, first and foremost, I suppose, nowadays, is the Predator drone. Not just Predator, but a, a, a fleet of, of drones. Uh, uh, and I, I, would, I would point out that, you know, it's often assumed, I think, uh, by the public at large, that the drone program is, is something that takes advantage of technology and allows us to, uh, uh, by remote control, uh, wage conflict, wage war against terrorist networks like Al-Qaeda and its affiliates are around the world, uh, I think our, our drone program, our, our targeting program, involves not just that technology and not just the operators, but also a, a, a vast network of intelligence relationships, uh, uh, including uh, uh, our uh, uh, intelligence services and, and their operations on the ground, cooperation with uh, 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 local organizations in these various regions in order to support uh, 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 that kind of, of targeting program. But yes, uh, 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 under the Obama administration, uh, uh, it's been widely reported uh, uh, that uh, the use of lethal targeting has actually uh, uh, expanded in, in recent years. So we would have to have someone on the ground, ideally, to point out where the terrorist is so he could be targeted for a drone strike. Well, right? it's, I think it's a variety of means, uh, 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 intelligence uh, uh, functions that support targeting operations. Sometimes it's, it's having uh, our forces or our intelligence uh, uh, agents on the ground. Sometimes it's cooperating with uh, uh, local governments, uh, 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 but 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 I think the the, the point is uh, 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 that the the drone program uh, uh, requires uh, uh, quite a bit of support, infrastructure, intelligence that uh, 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 that can only be uh, 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 supplied locally. So uh, the Obama has uh, killed; it has been reported forty-one terrorists since he's been in office. Uh, Brookings Institution says uh, that there's collateral damage. Ten people are killed for every uh, one terrorist who is killed in the course of an attack. Uh, assuming those figures are accurate, is collateral damage a, uh, a legal consideration in, in the use of uh, predator drones? Absolutely. And I, I mean, I think it's important to understand here that the use of drones uh, for targeting uh, uh, doesn't fall under some unique body of international law, uh, you know, drones law. Uh, uh, the, we, we apply the, the law of war, the law of armed conflict, or sometimes referred to as uh, international humanitarian law, which imposes certain uh, 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 restraints, uh, certain constraints on, on any 
use of military force or, or targeting. These include obligations to distinguish between military targets and civilians, uh, to refrain from actions that would cause uh, a, a civilian harm disproportionate to the expected military gain, often referred to as the principle of, of proportionality. And so absolutely, from a legal standpoint, uh, uh, collateral damage is a, a big concern. And as with, with other military uh, uh, actions, uh, I think even though uh, drones are a remarkably precise tool, I mean, when you think about uh, 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 drones in comparison to uh, 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 older forms of aerial bombardment, uh, uh, I think the, uh, uh, the drone program is a remarkably precise tool, but sometimes it does uh, unfortunately, tragically result in collateral damage, the, the death of innocents or destruction of, of civilian property. And I think that needs to be weighed, not just from a legal standpoint, but also from a moral and a strategic standpoint, that we have to worry about what kind of backlash or, or blowback might result from uh, uh, this kind of civilian harm or even just uh, uh, um, perceptions of, of, of civilian collateral damage. Now, it's said that the drone program is operated by both the CIA, or they do it in tandem with uh, the Department of the Air Force or the Department of the Army. Uh, now, is it, does it require a presidential finding or sign off for each drone attack? Well, sure. So one of the things that's been interesting over the last couple of years is we've, we've seen a, a bit of a convergence between what the, the military does in this area and what the CIA or the intelligence community do, in that both of them, it's, it's widely uh, reported and known, operate uh, uh, drone programs, operate uh, targeting programs. And so, so, so we have seen some uh, merging of those of, of, of those functions. They operate under uh, 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 different uh, uh, statutory authorities, different forms of congressional oversight, for example. Um, but I think many of the, the same basic rules uh, uh, with regard to who can be targeted uh, according to what kind of standards apply regardless of which U.S. government agency is, is, is in the lead uh, from an operational standpoint. Now, you were in the National Security Council in the uh, Bush ad administration and uh, also a special advisor, I guess, on legal matters to the National Security Advisor. Uh, is it required that the president personally sign off on each drone attack? Not from uh, a, a, a sort of legal standpoint, not in terms of the, the, the statutory frameworks as a matter of, 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 of U.S. law that applies here, and certainly not as a matter of international law is it required that the president personally sign off. It has been reported recently that the Obama administration has uh, been working to fashion some, and institutionalize some set of internal processes and rules that will uh, govern what is required uh, bureaucratically uh, uh, in order to uh, initiate a, a, a drone strike outside of a, a battlefield or a traditional combat setting. And uh, uh, it's been reported in these, in these news accounts that the Obama, that the President Obama has taken a, a, a personal role in signing off on, uh, on, on, on these operations. Uh, I, I think that's, uh, uh, more of a, a, a judgment that this administration has made as opposed to a legal requirement. So legally he could delegate the authority to somebody Legally else. he could delegate. Now there, now there are statutory requirements uh, uh, when it comes to, for example, covert action programs that the president must personally sign off in a, in a written finding that uh, operations or programs are uh, uh, important to U.S. national security interests uh, 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 and that he is uh, designating the, the CIA as the agent that's going to, to uh, uh, carry out these operations. So the president must be accountable, must take personal consideration of the, 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 the strategic necessity to take these actions and, 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 and the, the, the president's lawyers uh, in the National Security Council, for example, will, will vet these uh, uh, programs. But in terms of strike by strike, uh, uh, target by target, it's not legally required that the president uh, 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 personally sign off. 
Now, uh, Matt, is there a legal distinction between a drone strike and a targeted assassination, sending a team of Navy SEALs uh, overseas to take out somebody? Well, I, I, assassination is, has been manned for as a matter of, of U.S. Uh, uh, presidential executive order for decades. But I think assassination generally has a much narrower meaning, meaning than is, uh, is popularly believed, generally refers to, uh, is referred to, uh, re refers to the idea of a, of a sort of an unlawful political killing as opposed to going after uh, an, an enemy belligerent as we would consider uh, Osama bin Laden or uh, high-level al-Qaeda uh, 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 fighters. Uh, uh, as to the question of whether uh, 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 the same rules apply, whether you're attacking with a, a, a hot, sort of a high altitude drone versus sending in a, a team on the ground, I think the, the same basic rules, uh, uh, distinguishing between military and civilian uh, uh, targets, the proportionality of the judgment that goes into whether or not to uh, 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 take a shot, for example, those same basic rules will apply. Uh, 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 it may be that one particular technology or one particular means is, is more discriminating than another, is more capable of, of reducing collateral damage, and that might be relevant to the legal analysis. But I think the, the main, uh, 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 I think the main legal controversies uh, really boil down to whether or not lethal force can be used or not against a particular individual. And, and I think it's probably a mistake to uh, uh, focus too much on the particular technology. I know that drones in particular have, uh, uh, have sort of captured public imagination and there's a, a, a special controversy that comes, that surrounds the use of drones. But I think the same basic legal issues arise whether you're talking about a drone attack or sending in a, 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 a team of soldiers to take action on the ground. Well, uh, drones are certainly uh, attractive from a technological standpoint, from a U.S. perspective. I mean, if we'd had drones in 2001 armed with Hellfire missiles, we might not have had to send 100,000 troops to Afghanistan, uh, and we could have dealt with al-Qaeda that way. The drawback of drones, I suppose, in the bin Laden situation is if you send a drone to take out the whole house, uh, he might not have been there. You might have killed innocent people. There were children in the house, apparently, and, and other innocents. Uh, and uh, you might have gotten the, uh, you also might have gotten the wrong man. So you send in a team of SEALs. But uh, is there any real difference in law, whether you do one or the other? Well, again, I think there are a variety of different factors that would come into the to the legal analysis and 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 as you suggest sometimes the use of forces on the ground may be more discriminating than using a, a high altitude drone other times uh, a, a drone may be the the more uh, uh, precise or discriminating weapon of those that are available of course sometimes we don't have the option of sending forces in uh, on the ground. Uh, and that would be another factor that any decision maker would need to, to take into account from a legal standpoint as well as from a, a, an operational standpoint. I think, I think the one, one of the distinctions uh, uh, between drones and uh, other options, uh, uh, including even using uh, 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 manned aircraft, is that drones don't in the same way put our troops directly at risk. Right, they're operated remotely, and some argue that this is a problem. That uh, 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 that by reducing the exposure, the risk, the vulnerability to our own troops by using drones, uh, uh, they become perhaps too attractive an option to a president or any political leadership that has them in the in in the toolbox. That we may become a bit too uh, 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 that, that the use of force becomes a bit too easy and we may therefore overuse this option. And I think that's a, 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 an important debate uh, uh, when one thinks about what kinds of, of political constraints, not just legal constraints, uh, uh, exist and, and are important to limiting the use of force. In my own view, I think uh, uh, drones are a very, very important counterterrorism tool, but as with any of the other tools that we're, that we're talking about, they need to be used judiciously.
But of course, uh, uh, troops on the ground, a hit squad, uh, has uh, the option that if they get there and, and, and bin Laden isn't there in the house, uh, they can withdraw and perhaps we never would have heard of the operation. Perhaps, perhaps. Uh, uh, and I think, you know, these are the kinds of decisions that the, that the president probably had to weigh in, uh, in signing off on an operation like that to, 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 to kill uh, 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 bin Laden. Okay, so we uh, have the option of killing them, and if you can't kill them, there's also the option of capturing them. Right. And if you capture them, and then perhaps they can provide some intelligence. That's right. I mean, a big advantage of capturing them is is the possibility to then question or interrogate them. That one of the things we'd like to do if we get our hands, especially on high level planners, uh, uh, is uh, to be able to to question them, to gain intelligence about uh, future threats, uh, 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 operating practices of Al Qaeda and its allies, and and, and, and so forth. So if you capture them. Uh, presumably you'd want to detain them, and in the case of the war on terrorism, we decided to uh, detain them in Guantanamo. Many of and, them uh, have certainly uh, been detained at, at Guantanamo, although I'd say, you know, Guantanamo, like drones, has captured a lot of public attention. Uh, less attention has been given to the fact that we, uh, we, the United States, continue to hold a lot of detainees and have held over the years a lot of detainees uh, uh, at, at, at facilities inside Afghanistan that were basically uh, uh, factually similar uh, uh, in many cases, identical to those who were who were moved to, to Guantanamo, uh, 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 but we've ended up developing different rules for Guantanamo than uh, uh, than we may have at uh, let's say Bagram uh, Air Force Base, the detention facility that they were held in for a long time uh, uh, inside Afghanistan. Well, uh, certainly uh, focusing on Guantanamo, mm -hmm. there have been at least 780 or so uh, detainees yep. uh, resident there since. Uh, 2001, a lot have been released, uh, but there's that specter of detainees in orange jumpsuits wearing goggles and manacled, uh, and then all, uh, some have died there, some, some suicide. Uh, what are the legal implications of uh, whisking someone off a, a purported battlefield in Afghanistan and shipping them to Guantanamo and keeping them there? Uh, Indefinitely. Well, the position of, of, of both the Bush administration and the Obama administration remains that the United States is engaged in a war, an armed conflict with Al Qaeda and its allies. And therefore, as in any war, uh, uh, we can capture, uh, uh, detain, and hold until the end of hostilities enemy fighters. Uh, uh, this is true when we're fighting a war against another state, and we argue it's true when we're fighting against a non-state transnational terrorist network like al-Qaeda. Now, one big difference between uh, this war and wars against states is that it may be more difficult, it's often more difficult to distinguish between enemy fighters and civilians because uh, uh, al-Qaeda doesn't Distinguish between its its its, its fighters and, and 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 civilians in the way that uh, uh, professional military forces do. Uh, uh, there's an, uh, also a, a problem of how do we think about the end point of this conflict when we're at war with another state. When we went to war with uh, Iraq, we captured members of. Iraq's armed forces. We held them until the end of that war, and whereupon they were were released. We generally know, uh, not always, but we generally know uh, and can identify a, a pretty clear endpoint in a war against another state. And we don't have that same clarity with regard to the duration of this war with with Al Qaeda. And so these, I think these uh, 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 these distinctions between a war with a transnational terrorist organization like Al Qaeda and a more traditional state-on-state -state war, out of which the rules of detention grew, I think pose some real challenges for the law and policy with regard to Guantanamo and our, and, and our detainees. Well, the Supreme Court picked up the gauntlet and said they can't, the government can't detain these people indefinitely. They had to, at some point, grant them a hearing and uh, put them on trial or release them. Well, not quite. I mean, I think what the, what the Supreme Court has done, and actually, I think at, at this point, it's pretty clear that uh, uh, all three branches of the U.S. government are in agreement that we're in a, a state of armed conflict with Al Qaeda, and that the the executive branch, the president, can therefore detain enemy fighters and hold them uh, 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 for a, a, 
uh, till the dura for, for the duration for the duration of hostilities. Well, we'll see. I mean, this is this we, we we don't really have a good idea of how to measure the 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 endpoint of this conflict. But what the what the Supreme Court has not at this point said is uh, 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 that detainees need to be released or that they need to be prosecuted in court. What the, the Supreme Court has said is that with regard to American citizens held in inside the United States or now with regard to foreign detainees held at Guantanamo, the government must give them uh, access to federal court, habeas corpus. They can, uh, uh, they can petition a court to challenge the legality of their detention, so they have a right to a, a hearing before a, a judge. Uh, uh, but that hearing is not a, a trial. Uh, it's not a full uh, criminal prosecution where the government must prove beyond reasonable doubt that the individual committed a crime. The government must put forth uh, a, a, a persuasive uh, 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 justification that the individual is in fact a, an, an enemy fighter by a preponderance of the evidence according to certain uh, uh, rules of evidence and, and give the detainee a, an opportunity to rebut those claims. Uh, but this is not the same kind of procedural rigor, the same set of rights that we would normally uh, afford a, a suspect in a criminal trial. Okay, so now you have uh, the poster children of Guantanamo, those who were more directly involved in the uh, attack on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon, which were Khalil Sheikh Mohammed, KSM, and uh, I think uh, four others, so it's the, the Gitmo Five, and they're putting them on trial. I mean, do they need to put them on trial? Or? Well, as a legal matter, I, I think, uh, under the government's theory, no, and I think that's a strong argument. I mean, the, the argument of the government would be these uh, uh, individuals are, are held first and foremost uh, under the laws of war and as a matter of U.S. domestic law because Congress has authorized the president. Uh, 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 as of a, a, an act of Congress, September 18th, 2001, authorized the president to use all necessary and appropriate force against uh, uh, al-Qaeda fighters uh, and those who, who support them. And, and I think the, uh, 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 these high-value detainees, the, the uh, uh, masterminds of the 9-11 attacks, I think clearly fall within that statute, and I think clearly fall within inter an international legal definition of a, an enemy combatant or belligerent, an enemy fighter. Uh, uh, so I think uh, there's a strong legal argument that they could be held even without trial. Now the Obama administration could they be executed without trial? Uh, uh, no, no. I mean, once they've uh, once they've been captured and held. Uh, I, they, the, the U.S. government is obligated to treat them humanely. Uh, 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 it's the position of, 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 again, of all three branches of government at this point that they would be protected by uh, the so-called common Article Three of the Geneva Conven Conventions. This is a, 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 a set of baseline minimum protections that any uh, uh, detainee is entitled to, in, including uh, protections against cruel treatment. Now uh, they're going to be tried before military commissions. Before so military some talk commissions. of trying them in the federal court, as other terrorists have been tried quite successfully. Uh, do you uh, agree with the president's determination to try them before uh, a military court? I agree with the president's uh, decision that military commissions, uh, uh, these are uh, 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 military courts established uh, by statute that allow for the prosecution of certain types of, of suspects for war crimes, including al-Qaeda suspects. Uh, I, I agree with the president that this is a legal option and ought to be considered one among a number of tools that he, that he has available. But the president, President Obama's initial view, I think, was, and certainly the view of his attorney general was, let's prosecute them in federal court, in, 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 uh, in, in, perhaps here in, in New York. And I think that original instinct is also a, a valid uh, a legal option. And I think probably the better of, of, those, of those legal options. Because their rights would be safeguarded. Well, I, I think in both systems, military commissions and in our civilian court system, the, 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 the suspect is uh, granted a, a very high degree of legal protections and defendant rights. I think one of the advantages of our uh, uh, civilian court system 
is that it is uh, uh, one that we're very practiced in. We have a, 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 a long-standing set of rules of criminal procedure, of evidence, and so forth. Now, military commissions also have a very long history in our in our constitutional tradition, uh, going not back necessarily to a great one. No. Not always a great one. No, I think that's I think that's right. But it is a, a long one and, and a well established one. Um, uh, 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 but I think there are some some costs to going down that route. And as, as I say, I think both routes, a civilian prosecution and a, a military commissions prosecution, are both legally available tools. I think there are advantages and disadvantages of both. And the position of the Obama administration, which I think is a reasonable one, is that we should, we should take a pragmatic approach with regard to our, our, our detainees, that for some detainees, civilian prosecution is the right approach. Uh, uh, with others, military commissions is the right approach. And with others, uh, uh, detention without trial may be the, the right approach. Uh, uh, each of those, each of those has uh, uh, so, some some pros and, and, and some cons. Unfortunately, uh, we uh, have run out of time, but I have a question for you, <laughs> Matt Waxman. And the question is, what's the best way legally <laughs> to fight the war on terrorism? The best way to fight the war on terrorism is with a, a, a range of legal tools. I don't think there is a one size fits all solution to uh, uh, combating terrorism. No one-size-fits-all <laughs> solution. Matt Waxman, this has been just wonderful. Thank you for coming by. Thanks I hope you'll come me. again. And thank you for coming by. Tune in next week for more on the digital age. Please visit our website at www.digitalage.org. For the digital age, I'm Jim Zirin. Good night and all the best.